Welcome to the Crane Bag Podcast. I am Jay Leeming. Thank you for joining me. We are in the midst of exploring the great epic known as the Mahabharata. A mythical, historical epic that comes from the land of India. Thank you for joining me. And now, let us begin. Well, when the war was over, Yudhishthira no longer wanted to be king. I will go to the forest, he said. We have broken every rule. I am not fit to be king. We have become as evil as those we opposed. I will go to the forest. I will live on leaves and roots. I will live in silence and contemplation. And Krishna said, We have fought terrible powers, Yudhishthira. We have seen the earth laid waste, the whole world almost smashed like a clay cup. We have done what we had to do, and something has been preserved. And Yudhishthira said, We have lied, we have cheated, we have stolen this kingdom away. No, I do not think kingship and dharma can exist together. To be a king is to be opposed to the harmony of this world. I will leave it all behind. I will go live in the forest. And Bhima said, my brother, after all we've been through, all those years in the forest, all the work of war, all the death and the suffering, and now that we have the prize, you're going to cast it away like a handful of cold rice? My brother, the earth is crying out for a good king. You can be that king. Take up your destiny and sit on the throne. And Krishna said, Yudhishthira, do you know the story of Indra, king of the gods, and the demon Vritra? No, said Yudhishthira, I do not. Well, said Krishna, long ago, at the start of creation, the world was plagued by this demon, Vritra. He entered the realm of earth, boulders and stone, clay, pebbles and dust. He entered that realm, and because he was there, he stole the quality of smell from all things. Nothing had any smell, not flowers, not onions sizzling in a pan. All smell was subtracted from the universe. But Indra, king of the gods, pursued Vritra into the realm of earth. And there, in the darkness, inside a pebble, he found him hiding. And there Indra released his Vajra, his thunderbolt. Kablam! And he drove Vritra away into the realm of water, the realm of oceans and rain, of clouds and of dew on the morning grasses. Well, the demon Vritra entered this realm, and because he was in this realm, nothing had any taste. Nothing was salty or sweet or bitter or sour. There was no taste in creation. But Indra, king of the gods, entered the realm of water, and there, hiding in a drop of water in the depths of the sea, he found Vritra and he released his thunderbolt, kablam, and he drove the demon Vritra into the realm of fire. Now, because he was in this realm, this crackling, smoldering realm of fire, all sight was taken from creation. Everything was dark, complete darkness. Men, women, animals, everyone wandered around stumbling in complete darkness. But finally Indra found him there, hiding in the ashes of a fire gone cold. He found Vritra, and he released his thunderbolt. Kablam! And he drove Vritra away from the realm of fire into the realm of air. Wind and gusts going through villages, the breath in our bodies. Vritra entered this realm, and because he was in this realm, all touch was taken from the universe. Nothing had any feeling at all, the feathers on the back of a bird, pine needles dangling from a tree, the smoothness of a shell, all of these qualities were gone. But Indra pursued the demon deep into the realm of air, and there, hiding in a gust of wind, he found him, and he released his thunderbolt, kablam, and drove Vritra away into the realm of space. 
not simply outer space, but inner space as well. Height, depth, north, south, east, west, this realm through which all the elements of the world, earth, air, fire, and water, move like dancers on a stage. That is where Vritra went, into the realm of space itself. And there, hiding, Indra found him, and he released his thunderbolt. Kablam! And Vritra was destroyed. I am victorious. I am victorious, said Indra. Or am I? Is he really destroyed, he thought to himself? Is Vritra really gone? For each time so far, he has simply gone to another realm. I have driven him away from one realm only to find him in another. So how can I be sure that he is gone? Perhaps now he has simply gone to another level of existence. Perhaps he is still existing, plaguing us in some way, but just on another frequency. Indra pondered this, and then he said to himself, I will descend to the earth, and I will look for the demon Vritra. So Indra came down to earth. He took on the shape of a human man. He walked through a town. There were chickens, people walking here and there, men and women, a cow, an old woman selling cards, a, a boy running after a ball. All seemed to be fine. He did not see Vritra anywhere. Well, maybe he's in the countryside somewhere, thought Indra. So he left the town and went walking along a country road. Around him there were rice fields. People working in those fields were singing as they worked. He did not see the demon anywhere. Well, if I were a demon, thought Indra, I would go somewhere dark and mysterious. I would go to the wilderness. So Indra left the country road and walked into the forest. By this time, the sun was going down. The world was becoming dark. Indra walked through the forest without a trail, without a path, and he began to get confused. Am I really a god, he asked himself. Who is this Indra person? I mean, look at me. I'm dressed like a human man in this brown coat and these shoes. I must be human. Now humans also, they dream frequently of powerful things. So perhaps all that Indra stuff was just a dream. Yes, I'm definitely a human. And so he walked further into the dark forest. But as he walked, he began to wonder, but if I'm human, who am I? And do I have parents? Do I have children, a family, perhaps even a wife? What do I do in this world? I don't look like I do anything. Who am I? I guess, I guess I'm just lost. I'm a lost traveler, he thought to himself. And he walked through the forest, and it began to get cold. A cold wind was blowing. I'm lost. I'm cold. I need a place to spend the night, thought Indra. And there's nothing around. He looked as far as he could see. There were no houses anywhere. I'm lost in the woods. But he kept walking through the darkness relentlessly. And finally, far off, he saw a glimmer of light. It looked like a fire. Ah, fire, thought Indra. So he walked towards this fire far in the distance. And as he walked, he began to hear a sound. Jai Jai Indra Jai Jai Indra Jai Jai Indra Jai And as he got closer, he saw there was an old man, a sage, named Vasishta, and he was playing a great drum beside that fire, and he was singing a praise song in honor of Indra, king of the gods. Indra Jai Jai Indra Indra, Jai Jai Indra, Jai Jai Indra, Jai. And as he heard this song, its melody and its sound entered every bone of his body. And Indra thought to himself, I am not a lost traveler. I am not a human man. I am a god. I am Indra. And he took a Vajra, a thunderbolt that could not be seen, touched, tasted, heard, or smelled, a Vajra made entirely of thought, and he released it inside himself. Kablam! And he destroyed the demon Vritra, who had gone inside Indra to hide. Now I am victorious, said Indra. And he bowed down before Vasishta and thanked him for his song. And then Indra took a step up into the air, and then another and he left that dark forest behind him and ascended higher and higher until he came to the realm of Indra, king of the gods. 
and the gods welcomed him there, and there was his golden throne. And he sat down in that throne, and he said, I am Indra, slayer of demons. I am Indra, king of the gods. So you Dishtura, said Krishna, there is still a battle which you must fight, but you must fight it inside yourself. That is where the battlefield lies. It is a battle not to be fought with swords, spears, horses, or chariots, but only with thought. And you must fight this battle alone. I will go into the forest for three days, said Yudhishthira, and when I return, I will have made my decision. So Yudhishthira left the others and went into the forest. And he sat there in contemplation amidst the trees for three days. And time the finisher, time the bringer of life, time the destroyer moved forward, carrying all the things of this world on its back. And day became night, and day became night, and day became night became day once again. And Yudhishthira walked out of the forest. There was Krishna, there was Draupadi, there were Arjuna, Bhima, Nakula, and Sahadeva, all of them gathered by the river. And Yudhishthira said, this world needs a good king. I shall be that king, and I shall rule this realm with such wisdom as I possess. But first, my brothers, he said, we must spend a month outside the city of Hasanapura, a month here beside the river, cleansing ourselves of our crimes. Can you do that, my brothers? Can you do that, my dear Princess Draupadi? My brother, said Bhima, a month is a long time, but for you, I will do it. And all the others agreed as well. So they spent a month outside the city. They spent a month beside that river. And in that month, they remembered everyone they had lost in the battle. They remembered everyone they had killed. Arjuna spent time on a boulder, sitting in contemplation by the side of the river as the water flowed past, remembering the face of every soldier he had killed with an arrow or with a magical astra. And Bhima did the same, remembering everyone he had killed with his club or with his arrows. And Nakula and Sahadeva did the same. And Draupadi remembered all she had endured and how she had been dragged by the hair and remembered with sorrow the death of Abhimanyu and the death of so many, the death of Dushasana in that war. And she too mourned and grieved and honored their lives with her thoughts. And after a month, Yudhishthira said, Our time of sorrow is over. Let us enter the city and rejoice. So they all left the river and walked through the forest towards the city of Hastinapura. And soon they came to the gate of the city and it opened before them and they saw that the whole city had come out to greet them. There were weavers and farmers there. There were soldiers wounded in the war. There were mothers and fathers holding the hands of little boys and girls. And the people sang songs which filled the air like the songs of birds. And they threw flowers down at their feet. And many wept. So they moved through the city. And at last they came to the palace itself. And the palace doors opened. And they walked through the hallways and soon came to the palace garden. And there was the reflecting pool where they had once played as children. 
And there was the great banyan tree. And it was in flower. So they walked through the hallways and at last came to the throne room itself. And Yudhishthira, Arjuna, Bhima, Nakula and Sahadeva, and Draupadi sat down in golden thrones. And the people cheered and they rejoiced and everyone was happy. So the people of the kingdom were happy. But on that day, Yudhishthira noticed that Dhritarashtra and Gandhari were not there. Where have they gone? he said. And Krishna said, They have gone into hiding in the hills north of the city. That is no place for them, said Yudhishthira. We must summon them back here to live with us in the palace. Of course, said Krishna. But when they arrive, be sure to meet them in the palace garden. Why is that? said Yudhishthira. And Krishna said, They are filled with anger, but beneath that anger there is great sorrow. So, Meet them in the palace garden, where you and they will be close to water and to the earth. So that very day a golden chariot was sent north into the hills, and the next day a messenger came into the throne room and said, Your Majesty, Dhritarashtra and Gandhari have arrived. They are waiting for you in the palace garden. So the Pandavas and Draupadi left the throne room and walked into the garden. There was the reflecting pool, there was the great banyan tree, and there was Dhritarashtra, the blind king, and his queen Gandhari, with the veil over her eyes. And Dhritarashtra said, My nephews, are those your steps I hear? We are here, said Yudhishthira. And Dhritarashtra reached out and embraced Yudhishthira, and then Arjuna, and Nakula, and Sahadeva, and they wept for a long time. And then he said, Bhima, where is Bhima? And Krishna whispered quickly, Bhima, here, stand behind this statue. For there was a statue of an ancient strong man there in the garden. And Dhritarashtra staggered forward with his arms out, Bhima, Bhima, you who killed all of my sons. And he reached out and embraced the statue and brought his arms together. And with a great crack, the statue split and fell to the ground. And Dhritarashtra fell as well, weeping, and he wept and cried and pounded the earth. And then, as though he were someone awakening from a dream, he said, Bhima, are you here, or have I caused more death? And Bhima said, I am here, uncle. Will you hate me forever? No, said Dhritarashtra, for that will just bring more suffering. Now let me hold you in my arms. So once again he reached out for Bhima, and this time he embraced Bhima himself and tears fell from their eyes. And Gandhari embraced each of them in turn as well. And then she heard Krishna's voice and his footsteps, and she said, Krishna, Krishna, I curse you. It is not the Pandavas who are to blame. It is you. You have brought evil into this world. You have used tricks, lies, and deceit so that my family might murder each other. You have destroyed the earth. I curse you, Krishna. May all of your family massacre each other as my family has done. May your kingdom, your beautiful kingdom, be devoured by the sea. And Krishna said, Gandhari, all that you have described shall come to pass. And that night everyone ate together. And Krishna said, Gandhari, all that you have described shall come to pass. And that evening everyone ate together in the feasting hall of the palace, as they had so many years before. And then darkness covered the world, and everyone slept. And the next morning the sun rose, and it was a new day. And on that day there was much joy and excitement in the kingdom, for Uttara, 
the widow of Arjuna's son Abhimanyu was expecting a child. Days passed, and at length her time came, and in the darkness of the night all of the midwives gathered around her bed, and Kunti was there, and Draupadi, and Gandhari as well. And in that darkness she gave birth to a baby boy, and there were cries of joy, but as soon as the boy was born they all saw the child was grey and cold, that he did not breathe, that he had been born dead. So their cries of joy became cries of great sorrow. Weeping, their tears fell down to the earth, but Krishna was outside, and he stepped into the birthing room, and he said, Please, may I hold the baby? Weeping, Uttara handed her baby boy to Krishna, and Krishna held the cold, lifeless body of the child in his arms, and he said, Hello, little one, hello. And he whispered sweet words into the baby's ear, and as he did so, the cold, gray body of the child became filled with life, and he breathed in, and the child gave out a great cry. And everyone shouted with joy, and their tears fell to the ground once again, tears of joy. And Krishna said, He shall be named Pariksit, and in his time both he and his son shall rule this kingdom wisely and well. And he handed the baby boy back to Uttara. Weeping, she took the baby boy into her arms. So there was much rejoicing in the kingdom, for a child had been born, so there was new life in that kingdom. And the next day, there was a great celebration in honor of the birth of the child Pariksit. And there was a feast, and the best food was prepared, and there was singing and laughter and dancing, and flowers were thrown down onto the ground. And amidst this feasting, amid the laughter and the flowers, Yudhishthira could be seen at the edge of the room, standing with a drink in his hand alone beside a diamond-shaped window, looking out at the sacred river Ganges as it flowed past. And Krishna found him there and said, Yudhishthira, what are you brooding upon here alone, apart from the others? What are you thinking about as you watch the sacred river flow past? And Yudhishthira said, I think of Bhishma, our great teacher, whose death is on my shoulders. I think of Bhishma lying still on the battlefield on his bed of arrows. It is right that you think of him, said Krishna. For Bhishma is a wise man. He knows many things. He has seen the seeds of action and event flourish up into leaf and then die back down into the earth again. He possesses much wisdom. You should go speak with him and learn what he has to teach. He would not want to speak to me, said Yudhishthira. I am responsible for his death. I have caused him so much suffering. Bhishma has great affection for you and your brothers, said Krishna. It would be a gift to him to give him this opportunity to share his wisdom a gift to him and a gift to yourself and to those who come after you, for all of them will learn from his wisdom. There are still many days remaining until the winter solstice, until his death. Yudhishthira, go to him. Ask him the questions you have for yourself and for the future. Please, will you do this? Yudhishthira looked at him for a long time. I will, he said, but you must speak to him first. I am happy to do that, said Krishna. So the next day, Yudhishthira and his brothers, together with Draupadi, Dhritarashtra, Gandhari, and Kunti, 
got in their chariots and traveled from the palace of Hastinapura through the city and through the city to the forest and through the forest to the grasslands and over the hills until they came to the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And there they got out and they walked across the rutted, scarred ground of that battlefield. For the earth had not yet healed itself. There were still broken chariot wheels there and bits of metal. Only in a few places a little grass was starting to grow. And at the edge of this battlefield they saw a bed of arrows, and there was Bhishma. They all stopped a little way off from him, seeing him there lying on his bed of arrows. And Krishna went ahead alone to speak with him. Bhishma, he said, greetings to you. I have come with Yudhishthira, his brothers, and their families. We have come to pay our respects. And Yudhishthira, in particular, has many questions he wishes to ask you. He wishes to learn from you all that you have to teach. Tell me, will you speak with them? Oh, Krishna, said Bhishma, my mind is not clear right now. My body is racked with pain. My thoughts are a confused wind filled with shreds of wisdom and jolts of great suffering. Though I care for the Pandavas, I could not speak with them right now. And Krishna said, Bhishma, I will remove all suffering from your body from now until the moment of your death. And as he spoke these words, Bhishma himself gave out a great sigh. <sighs> and Krishna said, Now will you be able to speak with them, for you have much wisdom that is rare in this world. And Bhishma said, Thank you, Krishna. Thank you for what you have done. Now my mind is clear, my heart open, my body free of pain. Yes, tell them to come, and I will speak with them. So Yudhishthira came, and he placed a flower beside Bhishma's bed of arrows, and he said, Bhishma, my teacher, forgive me, forgive me for what I have done. By my actions I have caused your death, I have given you much suffering. Forgive me, O oh teacher. And Bhishma said, I forgive you, Yudhishthira. You acted according to your dharma and according to the dharma of the world. War is something which happens to us, like a wind happens to a tree filled with leaves. And now that wind has passed. Yudhishthira, I forgive you. And then Arjuna came, and he too laid a flower down by the bedside of Bhishma. And the two of them spoke and wept together and they each forgave each other the many sufferings they had caused upon the other. And Bhima came, Nakula, Sahadeva, Draupadi, Dhritarashtra, Gandhari, they all came, they laid flowers down there beside Bhishma. And then Bhishma said, I am glad you all have come. Yudhishthira, come tomorrow, you and your brothers, and I will speak with you, and I will tell you whatever it is you want to know. So they left Bhishma there and returned to the palace. And the next day Yudhishthira came with his brothers. And Yudhishthira went to the bedside of Bhishma. And Bhishma opened his eyes and looked at him and said, What is it you want to talk about? And Yudhishthira said, Bhishma, tell me, what is it that makes a good king? How should such a king act? How should his mind be? What decisions should he make? What must he do to ensure that the kingdom he rules over flourishes and that everyone is happy and that the land is preserved? And Bhishma spoke, answering this question, spoke for a long time, and his words were a river flowing into this world and out again. And Yudhishthira had other questions besides this about justice and law and war and peace and how to make sure that there would be no suffering in his kingdom. And Bhishma spoke for a long time. And this went on for many days. And each day Yudhishthira came and he asked Bhishma, about life and about death, about the trees that flower 
and the trees that die. He asked him about the stars and about the age of the universe and how Dharma can be preserved. And if it is ever all right to tell a lie and how to avoid sickness. He asked him many questions, each question a thread, a loose thread that Bhishma took and wove into a tapestry. And looking at that tapestry, you would see the whole world, every leaf, every branch, every bird, every cave of sorrow, and every great mountain of happiness. And in this world that Bhishma spoke aloud to Yudhishthira, there were seeds and there were scars. And there was trouble and there was laughter. And always at the heart of each thing, every stone and every wolf, there was a great joy. So they spoke for many days. And finally the winter solstice was near, and everyone gathered around the bed of arrows upon which Bhishma lay. And Bhishma himself began to speak aloud the 1,008 names of the god of this world, chanting them as his breath went in and his breath went out. My time has come, he said. The hour of my death has come at last. And his breath shifted and moved. His breath entered the melody of those names, names for the great God of this world. And this melody carried him forward in time to his last breath which left him, went out of his mouth and up into the air. And Bhishma's eyes closed, and his heart went still, and he died. And everyone around his bed of arrows wept, wept for a long time. And then they sang the old songs of sorrow and of mourning. And that day they burned his body on the battlefield the smoke rising up into the air. And that evening, they all went to the river Ganges and made offering to the river in honor of Bhishma, the grandfather of them all, Bhishma, the son of the river. And their voices went up into the bright air, singing and chanting the melodies weaving themselves into the day. And as the sun approached the horizon, out of the river there came a woman. She walked right out of the river. First her head could be seen, then her shoulders, then her hips, then her knees. And then there she was, standing on the bank, and the drops of water flowed down her body as if each one adored her. And this woman wept and cried and said, O oh, Bhishma, breath of my breath, life of my life, O oh, Bhishma, O oh, my son. And her tears fell from her eyes down into the earth. And Krishna said, Gunga, goddess of the river, Gunga, you who are the river itself, I honor and praise you, your glittering beauty. But I tell you now, do not sorrow, do not grieve for your son Bhishma. He came from the world of the gods to this earth, and now he is returned to the world of the gods. So do not sorrow and do not grieve. And Gunga said, Krishna, he was my son, and I loved him, and therefore I grieve. And then sadly she turned and walked back into the river, First her knees went under, then her hips, then her shoulders, and then her head. And then there was only the beautiful river flowing mercilessly 
past. And when all their songs had become silence, when all the tears had left their eyes, everyone went into the palace of Hastinapura and feasted together. And they ate and drank and sang songs, and they told stories of Bhishma and his many adventures on this earth. And then the bard sang a song filled with twilight and goatskin. And then darkness covered the world, and everyone slept. <laughs> And like a dream, 16 years passed. Years of peace, prosperity, and happiness. The kingdom flourished, for Yudhishthira ruled wisely and well. And the land flourished also. seemed perhaps even the gods were content. And then one day, two farmers entered the throne room of the palace of Hastinapura, and one of them was carrying a clay jar. And the man thumped the clay jar down on the floor, and removed the lid, and Yudhishthira could see that it was filled with gold pieces. And the man said, I recently sold some land to my friend here, and after I sold it to him, he plowed the land. And as he was plowing the land, he found this clay jar filled with gold pieces. Now he insists that it should come back to me, for I did not know the gold pieces were there when I sold him the land. But I say, I sold him the land, I sold him everything on the land, everything beneath the land, so these gold pieces should go to him. It's an extra gift, a bonus for buying this land from me. So we cannot decide, and we have come to you to help us settle this disagreement. Hmm, said Yudhishthira. And then Krishna turned to him and said, Yudhishthira, tell these two farmers to come back in three months. If they do that, in three months, this disagreement will be much easier to solve. Yudhishthira looked at him in surprise, but then turned to the farmers. Gentlemen, he said, I must ask you to return in three months. I will deliberate upon this question and then decide when you return. Well, three months passed, and then the farmers came back. Only this time it was the other farmer who held the clay jar in his arms. And when he came into the throne room, he did not thump it down on the ground, but held the clay jar filled with gold pieces tightly in his arms. And he said, Your Majesty, this, this agreement of ours has changed a little bit, you see. Because uh, it's true, I bought some land from this man here, just as he said, and I plowed the land and I found this jar of gold pieces. But we've changed our, our terms a little bit, our opinions. I now believe this jar should go to me because I bought the land and I bought everything under it. So this jar must go to me and he demands the jar back because he did not know it was there. So we come to you once again to settle this disagreement. Yudhishthira looked at them both and he said, I will divide the gold pieces in the jar into three piles. One shall go to each of you and a third shall go to me as my fee for settling this dispute. That is my decision. Well, the farmers grumbled a little bit about this decision, but nevertheless they went away, though it's true they forgot the clay jar behind them and left it in the corner of the throne room. What does this mean? said Yudhishthira. Since the farmers were last here, said Krishna, the Kali Yuga has begun, the fourth and last age of the world. It is a time of darkness and evil, in which greed and fear rule all things, and generosity will be in short supply. For this reason, these two farmers, who originally were only concerned with the welfare of the other, now are focused only on what they can get for themselves. Yudhishthira, listen closely. For the last sixteen years, you, Draupadi, and your brothers have known great happiness, have known peace and contentment. But now the shadows deepen. Now the music of what happens twists itself into a new key. 
Now, Yudhishthira, everything will change. Welcome, and thank you for listening to this story. Here is a poem for you by the American poet William Stafford. The poem is called Recoil. The bow bent remembers home long, the years of its tree, the whine of wind all night conditioning it and its answer, twang. To the people here who would fret me down their way and make me bend, by remembering hard I could startle for home and be myself again. I'll give that to you a second time. Recoil. The bow bent remembers home long, the years of its tree, the whine of wind all night conditioning it, and its answer, twang. To the people here who would fret me down their way and make me bend, by remembering hard I could startle for home and be myself again a poem by William Stafford. William Stafford, born in 1914 in Hutchinson, Kansas, who died in Oregon in 1993. A poet who wrote a poem every day, uh, whether it was good or bad. He would get up in the morning and write a poem, and he would revise it through the day. And, uh, you know, 
he got a lot of poems out of that. <laughs> he was asked once uh, what he did if his poem wasn't that good on that day. And he said simply, I lower my standards, he said. Anyway, so why do I think of that poem? I think of that poem because Indra forgets who he is. Indra the god forgets that he's a god and wanders, you know, aimlessly through the universe. I think of that poem because I've forgotten who I am. I could say at times, perhaps you have too. You forget who you are, not your name and your number, you know, but you forget your, uh, the true you, what you are about, who you are in the world. I love that story at the beginning, Indra and Vritra, the demon. And this is told to encourage Yudhishthira, of course, who wonderfully has decided not to be king. After all this fuss, after all this, the exile, the 18 days of horrific war in which the earth is nearly destroyed, he decides that it all, it was not worth it. Like he has debased himself so much simply by fighting that war. He and his brothers have lied, they've cheated, they've stolen the crown from their opponents, the Kurus, from Duryodhana and his brother. So he decides not to be king. It's a marvelous moment. Again, it's not a particularly Hollywood moment. Usually we win and we're like, yes, all right, I won, I was right, we're good, they're evil, we're, we won. But now he's questioning all of that. And Krishna is the one who tells him this story about Indra and Vritra. Vritra the demon, who was just messing up the universe early on by inhabiting these various elements. Earth, air, fire, water, and uh, space, as it were. Space, the Akashic realm, I think it is in, in Sanskrit, the realm in which all these things happen. And in each realm, he, he takes away a sense, you know, tust, touch, taste, hearing, all these things, smell, they all go. Uh, and finally, he hides within Indra himself. It's a wonderful story of uh, encouragement, a wonderful story of remembering who you are. And Indra is reminded of who he is by this sage, Vasishta, who is playing this drum. It's fantastic. And playing this song in praise of Indra. What do we get from that? I don't know. What do you get from that? I feel like I could sit with that for a long time. It's praise which brings Indra back. It is someone remembering him which brings him back. We depend upon others. In America, in particular, we like to think it's all up to us. Alone we can do it. But here, Indra has lost his way, lost who he is. And the sage of Vasishta remembers. He remembers Indra and he praises him. So perhaps it's by praise that we are reminded of our true gifts and of what we have to give to the world and what our role is in this theater of life and we come back to ourselves. Vasishta, incidentally, was the sage who had a magical cow which eight gods then stole. One of those gods was Bhishma, and, well, one of those gods was uh, then reincarnated as Bhishma and at the beginning of our whole epic cycle here, at the beginning of the Mahabharata. Uh, just pointing that out. These sages are fantastic. They're just these pillars that just kind of remain throughout the story and are always there. Pillars, or perhaps they're like flowing rivers, like the Ganges itself, herself, perhaps. So I invite you to find your own way into this story. One way in is to ask yourself questions. When did you lose your way? When did you seek answers from a dying man on a battlefield? When were you so angry that you felt like you could crush a statue to dust? When did you crave that clay jar filled with gold pieces? And when were you strong enough to give it away? In this part of the story, we get the aftermath of the war. And there's a wonderful tranquility to this part of the story. In fact, one of the books of the original, uh, if I can use that term, original, is called simply that, Tranquility. Uh, that's the English translation, of course, but Tranquility. And there is a sense of calm at last. Calm arrived at after much chaos and destruction. 
And amid that calm, we get the final death of Bhishma. Bhishma, who can choose the moment of his death and has chosen to die shortly after the winter solstice in the calendar of the year. And Yudhishthira goes to him and asks him all these questions. And I should tell you that in the uh, original uh, version of this story, now I use that word original uh, advisedly with some uh, reservation because a story like this is alive and has been told so many times, is being told now, like in India, like for sure, like for certain. Um, is the Odyssey being told in Greece? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, but the Mahabharata is certainly being told in India. It is very much alive there uh, in the mouths of storytellers, in the voices of storytellers, in the art, in the movies and films, uh, of course, of the modern age. So when I say there's an original, well, I mean the, the Sanskrit that has come down to us. But that is just one version of many versions of this story that have existed and hopefully will continue to exist. In any case, uh, the original, to use that word, uh, has a ton of talk by Bhishma. So Bhishma teaches Yudhishthira, and he does it for a long, long time, I'm telling you. So I got the whole thing here. It's a ten-volume set of the Mahabharata, translated into English. Each volume is about 400, 500 pages, and one and a half of those books is just Bhishma talking. <laughs> it's just Bhishma's advice, and it's fascinating. I mean, uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to read the whole thing. Parts of it are definitely boring or look boring to me, um, but it's amazing. He just talks and talks. Much of what he says is, in fact, stories uh, told by other people. He's quoting other people. I'm going to open this up at random here, pretty much, and uh, here's a page. Yeah, page 137, chapter 1574 of this book, uh, and here's Bhishma talking, and he's quoting Vyasa. Vyasa said, There is a colorful tree of desire in the heart. It is generated from the store of confusion. Anger and insolence constitute its gigantic trunk. The desire for knowledge is the source of its liberation. Ignoration, ignorance is its root, and delusion sprinkles it with water. Jealousy makes up the leaves. Earlier acts provide the fertilizer. Lack of judgment and lack of thought are the branches. Sorrow makes up the terrible smaller branches, etc. Um, so here we go. Here's another random one. Bhishma said, Once Janaka's son was roaming around in a desolate forest. In the course of the hunt, he saw Brahmana Rishi, who was Birgu's descendant. Vasuman bowed his head down before the seated sage and also sat down. Having taken his permission, he then asked him a question. O oh, illustrious one, what brings the greatest benefit, in this world and in the next, to a man who possesses a temporary body but is overcome by desire? Well, there you go. Um, the writer, Argentinian writer, uh, Borges, has a story called The Book of Sand, in which uh, he describes an infinite book, a book which you open and you see a page in some language telling some story or describing something, and then you close the book and you never see it again because the next time you open it, you've got another page of some sort. And the book is always changing and is infinite, so it seems. Parts of the Mahabharata have that feeling. In fact, it's possible, some have suggested that Borges, in fact, was thinking of the Mahabharata when he wrote that short story. Those two little passages I read you from Bhishma's uh, teachings in the Mahabharata, like I say, it's in volume nine of the collected works. This particular volume is 700 and, let's count, Jay, 718 pages. Now, what Bhishma has to say uh, also spills over into volume 10, and it starts in volume 8. So am I going to find that thing again? I, well, I could. I could page through this thing. I could read the whole thing. Maybe someday I will. Um, but what is my point? What is my point is that the, the magnificence and the oceanic quality of this story is just fantastic. And I love it. It is not simple and it's over with. It is like a cosmos. And Bhishma's dialogues alone, Bhishma's teachings alone, are themselves a vast sort of universe within the universe of the Mahabharata. 
And of course, it's sweet how Yudhishthira goes and wants to learn from him. This wonderful respect and valuing of the elders, which in the modern world we are completely, of course, uh, losing if we haven't lost it completely. The elders have no one to teach and they lose their way. They feel lost. They have no place in society. Here is Bhishma on his deathbed and he has wisdom to give and he has someone who is, wants to listen, Yudhishthira, someone who will in fact put that wisdom into practice. So later on in this little section of the story, we had 16 years of peace and harmony in the kingdom. Who's to say? But perhaps that peace and that harmony are the direct result of these teachings. Because because Yudhishthira asks Bhishma about how, what a king should do. You know, what should a king do? How should he act, he or she? Uh, so it's very possible. I think it's no mistake that we get this teaching by Bhishma, and then we get the kingship of Yudhishthira, which uh, goes well. So well that there's no stories about it. We just kind of say 16 years passed and everything was great. So perhaps if we listen to our elders, whoever they are, elders of the blood, elders of the culture, elders of the literary sort, if we listen to the, the wisdom of those who have gone before, uh, perhaps we too can know happiness and peace in this way. So this part of the story has what might seem to be scattered stories in it, but they're all moving in a single direction, which is to have a good king in charge of things. And we begin with the doubts of Yudhishthira. It's wonderful that he has doubts. I've got doubts. Do we need kings? I don't know. Forget it. Kings, queens, forget it. Um, well, we all have doubts. So he has these doubts and they're dealt with. And then we have these teachings by Bhishma, uh, which also lead towards him becoming a good leader. Because we want good leaders, don't we? We want, we need good, compassionate leaders. And then we get this wonderful scene where Gunga comes back. Gunga, who is the goddess with which the story began. Gunga, who is the river Ganges, as we say in English. Uh, Gunga, who is the goddess of those waters and is those, is those waters themselves. And comes out and weeps because Bhishma has died. Though he is eternal, though he is a god come down to earth and then returned, Still she weeps, of course, as we weep, because it is sad. Of course, that's why we weep. It's that simple. And notice, too, how this story is mingling, how this story is weaving together the godlike realms, the spiritual realms, and the daily realms. Uh, it has been said that the job of an epic poet, an epic storyteller, is to connect heaven and earth, is to join heaven and earth. And so we see this in this story very intensely. Bhishma coming down to earth. All of the Pandavas, of course, are descended from gods. The gods and the humans are just mingled throughout this story. And I just think of this when I think of Gunga there on the shore, uh, weeping for Bhishma, though he has gone back to the realm of the gods. And she goes into the water, and we don't hear from her again. And then, of course, we get these two farmers and this beautiful way of illustrating the beginning of the Kali Yuga. The Hindu conception of time is extremely large, but includes uh, these four ages of the world, which you also see in Greek mythology to some extent uh, and in other mythologies as well, uh, frequently connected with metals uh, in the Greek, for example, you know, the realm of gold, you know, bronze, iron, they were in the Iron Age, all that stuff. In the Hindu conception, these four ages of the world are connected to a dice game and the four possible throws in a particular dice game. And one throw being the winning throw and the other three being gradually less. Uh, which is another fascinating thing. It, just think about that. You know, the, the throw of some dice is equivalent to an age of the world. And by age of the world, we mean a really long time, like thousands of years. So as Krishna makes clear, we're in the Kali Yuga right now, which is the last age. It's when Dharma, which is the 
the law which upholds all things, the guiding principle of the universe, dharma is not observed by many and is in decline. And so the universe will destroy itself and then be renewed again. And in this part of the story, we see that in the story of the two farmers, who at first are all too willing to give the pot of gold to the other. And then after we've crossed that little doorway, after we've crossed that threshold into the Kali Yuga, now they both want the gold for themselves. Because greed is the guiding principle, you know, at the heart of this age. Greed and fear, these negative emotions. So in the face of that, what do we do? Well, we are generous and we give to others. And that perhaps will prolong the universe for a little longer. So it might be tempting to say this story is over. But I caution you, I urge you to remember that that is not the case. Uh, there's a beginning and a middle and an ending to all things. And we, in our modern way of thinking, might want to stop here. Oh, we had a happy kingdom for a while. Everything's great. Hey, everything's great. But in fact, there is a autumn to this story. There is a winter to this story, out of which this story will be born again. It'll start again. And in our next and final installment, uh, we will enter that autumn, enter that winter, when the trees are bare, and we will see what all the characters uh, come to, where they go in this last vision of the epic of the Mahabharata. Please join me for that. And once again, I would thank all the Patreon supporters out there who make this possible. And if you are able to join them, please do so. Uh, that's patreon.com slash storyjl. You can find me there. And if you are seeking more stories, uh, you can find them on my website, jleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. Thank you for listening to this, and uh, may we be generous with each other. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.